how many of you like paying taxes? Anybody? Yeah, right? Raising your hands real high, right? Oh, I love paying taxes. Um, when I moved here from Minnesota about 10 years ago, um, one of the hardest things to get used to was paying tolls. And then when I owned my own home, having to pay property taxes and all of this money that's going to the government. And I'm like, what? Especially, I mean, Haley and I, we've got a kid on the way coming in September, but I'm paying taxes into the city that's going to schools. And I don't got kids in the school, right? Like, so there's this idea every day, you want to make me get in a bad mood real quick, show me on my paycheck where all the money is going to taxes, I'll be in a bad mood real quick. Um, and I bring that up because the portion of Scripture that we're talking about today is all about Jesus' interaction with tax collectors. Um, before we get into the reading, I think it's important for us to take a minute and understand contextually what it means to be a tax collector in biblical times. Because it's easy for us in our current culture to think, oh, well, it's just people who work for the IRS. And nobody really likes the IRS, right? I mean, we, all, I think we can all agree on that. But this is a little different. Um, tax collectors in this time, they worked for the Roman government. Uh, and uh, promised land, promised land that was promised to the Israelites was under Roman occupation. Uh, and so if you were a tax collector, there were all kinds of things that, they, that the Roman government taxed. They taxed trade, they taxed property, they were all kinds of stuff. Um, but typically the tax taxation system was kind of split into two different halves. Uh, one was for, um, like if you own property or things like that, stuff that was more concrete, more specific, uh, and the system that surrounded that and the tax collectors who were part of that system, uh, it was pretty regulated and it was pretty stringent. It's pretty easy to know, okay, this is how much property you have or this is how much goods you have or whatever, and then they would just pay it because they had to. Um, and there was no real major loopholes to be able to game the system. Um, but then there was the other side of tax collection, which dealt more with like commerce and trade and travel and and I would say these, these guys were more, you can almost liken them to toll booths that were set up throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, major trade routes, different locations like funnel points. Uh, they'd have these booths that were set up, uh, and then they'd be collect, collecting taxes based on whatever it was that you were bringing into the city or whatever reason it was that you needed to be there. Um, these guys were paid a little bit differently. The agreement that they had with the Roman government, they... There was one main tax collector, chief tax collector. Those of you who are familiar with the story of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector. They paid for the rights of taxation within a certain region. Then under them, there were multiple grassroots tax collectors at each of these different booths and stations. And the deal they had with the Roman government was, here's how much you owe us. It's a set amount from what you collect. Anything that is above that, that's your wage. That's your salary. That's what you get to keep. And so as you can imagine, <laughs> under the power of the Roman government and soldiers, if they had the rights to legally tax you really whatever they felt was fair, and if you said no or disagreed with them in any way, they would take everything that you had and then throw you in prison. So it's not really much of an option, right? You kind of have to pay it. So the taxation system and these tax collectors in particular were kind of this necessary evil in order to be under the Roman government and Roman rule. Uh, so they didn't have a very good reputation. I mean, could you imagine driving through Illinois and every time you go to a toll booth, someone's like, that'll be $25. You're like, that's crazy. Are you insane? All right, now you're going to jail. Oh, and we're taking your car and we're taking all your stuff. I'd be pretty upset with, <laughs> with toll booth workers uh, if that's what they were doing, right? But that's the system that they had. Uh, and so for the Jewish people in particular, it was almost like an added insult to injury in the fact that it was a constant reminder of the fact that they were under Roman rule, land promised to them by God, and it wasn't theirs right now. And then in addition to that, the nature of the business is just kind of shady and you're taking advantage of people. But this is a real quick, easy, and very lucrative way to make money. So a lot of people chose this profession despite the fact that it was really hated. I mean, it wasn't, you weren't going to become 
wealthy aristocrat like, you know, kings and lords and things like that, but you were definitely in the upper middle class, making a lot of money. And so for a Jewish person to choose this profession was a pretty conscious decision to say, I'm going to choose money over God because the reality is to be a tax collector for those who were Jewish, you were unclean. deemed unclean. They weren't allowed to go to the temple and make sacrifices and present their tithes or their offerings. Which means ultimately that they're unable to be reconciled with God. So it's like they were choosing money over God. So if you weren't a tax collector, if you were not unclean, you did not deal with tax collectors unless you absolutely had to. It was, again, one of these necessary evils of, okay, I'm having a conversation because I need to give them their money, and that's about where the relationship ends. They don't have anything to do with tax collectors. And you're certainly not spending time shooting the breeze with them or hanging out or, or, heaven forbid, actually eating with them. And so then we come to our reading here. And uh, for those of you that are new, we, uh, whenever we read Scripture together as a church, uh, we stand together. And the reason for that is because we believe that the Word of God is exactly that. It is God's Word to us. It's not just a letter. It's not just a bunch of stories that were written. This is instruction. This is God's Word to us. Uh, and so we stand in honor and reverence to it. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 27. It says, After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at tables with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, saying, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. And have a seat. Let me start out with prayer here. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it challenges us. We also thank you that at the same time it can bring comfort. Father, I pray that that's what, that's what happens this morning. Lord, I pray that anything that comes from me, uh, that it would be forgotten, Lord. But anything that's of your spirit that is spoken this morning, I pray that, that it would stick with us, that it would challenge us in our walk with you, uh, that it would challenge us to come to repentance uh, and to, to do as the disciples did when you said, come follow me, for us to just, just say yes and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as I said earlier, I moved to Illinois uh, about 10 years ago. I um, came from Minnesota. And I grew up in a Christian home, a little bit about me. Grew up in a Christian home in Minnesota. I was kind of one of those guys who wasn't really the rebellious kid. I don't wear that like a badge of honor or anything like that, please. I had, definitely was rebellious in my own way. But I wasn't real big into the party scene or, or any of that sort of thing. Um, and I tried to do my best to just be used by God and wherever it was that he had me, and I was a leader in my youth group, and I helped on the worship team, and all kinds of different stuff, Um, and then I moved here to Illinois because I felt very strongly that God said, this is where you belong. So I moved here, and I really only knew maybe two people, and I knew them because of the church that I had gone to at the time, and, uh, and they were like, hey, you want to get to know some more people? You want to meet some new people? And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm like fish out of water here, totally new people, new area, just getting a job, just learning to know the area. Uh, yeah, I'd love to meet some people. And so they go, great, I, there's this friend of ours putting on this, this get-together, uh, me and this other friend who were at the church, uh, we're going as well, and do you want to go with? I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. And they're like, cool, I'll meet you. Uh, at a certain time, I can't remember when it was, but they picked me up and we drove to this party. And boy, did I have a shock in my life when I got to the party. 
Uh, this was, there was a lot of alcohol, there was a lot of drinking. Um, there were multiple people you could categorize as potheads. Uh, this is a group of people that I was unfamiliar with working around and being around. Um, and I don't, I don't say that in any kind of a judgmental way at all. I just say it in the sense that I was a fish out of water big time. And at that time, I'm thinking to myself, I should not be here. <laughs> like, I'm a person who was a leader in my youth group for years, right? I was a worship leader. I was, you know, going down the list of all the different good Christian things that I was doing that I kind of hung on to to be this safe, good Christian life kind of going person. And me just being around these people was like making my Jesus stock decline rapidly, right? Like, credibility of this guy out the window, right? But I got a ride there, so where am I going, right? Like, what am I going to do? I got nowhere to go. So I'm just like, all right, Lord, make the best of this, right? You're coming here to meet new people, so that's what you're going to do. You're going to meet new people. Um, and I did meet some new people. There was this one guy in particular. His name was Andy. He was a total pothead. I don't think he understood a word I was saying. But he remembered who I was later. And I say that because I think I can relate a little bit to probably what the disciples are thinking in this scenario. I mean, these are guys, at this point, you've got Andrew, Peter, James, and John who have already said yes to following Jesus. And when you say yes to following Jesus, he didn't say, hey, by the way, we're going to be spending a whole lot of time with some really ugly, sinning kind of people. Are you in for that? Probably would have said, no, no thank you. He just said, come follow me, and they dropped what they were doing, and they went. And then Jesus says the same thing to Matthew. You're going, Matthew, what do you mean Matthew? His name was Levi. That's the only, the last time in Scripture that we know him as Levi uh, is right here. From this point on, uh, he's known as Matthew. He's the disciple. He wrote the Gospel of Matthew. And this is their introduction. And I can imagine if I was one of the disciples, I mean, I can imagine Peter, right? Because Peter's always got something to say, right? And he's thinking, did you just tell that guy to be a part of this thing? Really? Like you're a rabbi. You're, you're the Messiah, and you're asking a tax collector to join our crew. Well, we had a good run, right? I mean... <laughs> There's, you know, six of us now. That's pretty good for a rabbi, right? It's, it's all right, I guess. I guess that'll do. And then on top of that, then Matthew gets real excited and he drops everything that he's doing. He packs up his booth. He's like, you know what? I'm going to throw a party. This is amazing. We need to celebrate. And he throws a party and he invites everybody he knows. And everybody he knows is an unclean tax collector and sinner. And then Peter and the rest of the disciples are like, what on earth are we doing here? Like, this is, not, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, it doesn't say that they said anything. I'm sure Jesus would have corrected them if they did. But I can, I can relate to the fact that that's probably what's going on in their minds at this time. But they went. They went. And it doesn't say anything about them grumbling or complaining. They just followed Jesus. Because that's where he was going. And it started with the call that they got. It's the same call that Matthew got. Jesus just says simply, come follow me. And they drop everything and they go. I think there's a lot, in, in our culture today, there's a lot of people who say yes to Jesus, but they don't understand that they're actually called to follow Jesus and what that means. 24-7, you are on call to go where he goes and does do what, what he's calling you to do. How many of you have ever worked or know someone who's worked in a job where you were on call? Right? Yeah. Haley, there was a time, she works in medicine, there was a time when she was working at a, at a place where she was on call for a, a period of time. 
And man, was that crazy. It didn't matter what we were doing, where we were going. It's like she was attached literally at the hip to this beeper. If it went off, everything stopped. I got to deal with this. Do you feel called? If you've said yes to Jesus, do you feel called? Notice that Jesus didn't say and go out and say, hey, here's everything that we're going to do. Here's all of what's expected of you. He just said, no, here's who I am. Make a decision. Are you going to follow me or are you not? We'll take care of the rest of that later. We'll figure out exactly how it all comes together and, and what stuff you maybe need to have worked on and, and different things that make you uncomfortable, but I'm going to bring you there anyway because they need, they need to know God. All of that stuff happens later, but it starts with a call. If you accept that call, do you understand and feel, feel it in your life every day? Do you know the weight of what it means to really be called by God to follow Jesus? Typically, people say no to that call for really two reasons. One is moral superiority, and the other one is moral inferiority. Superiority being, of course, that, well, I don't, I've got it all together. I got my life figured out. I don't need Jesus. I don't need church. I don't need any of that. I'm doing good all on my own. I'm a good person, right? That's the moral inferiority concept. That's where the Pharisees were, right? And we'll get to that. But then there's this other side of moral inferiority. And this is something, to be honest with you, this is the one that I probably wrestle with out of the two. Feeling like, why on earth am I the one God is calling to follow him? I mean, I've got this wrong in my life, I've got that wrong in my life, I do this, I do that, I, whatever, fill in the blank, right? We've all got our own things. And truth be told, it's, it's easy to just be like, nah, I can't be used by God, there's no way he wants me, there's no way he wants to me to follow him. Matthew could have easily said that. It's like, here's this rabbi guy. And odds are he was around, he heard what he was saying, he heard what he was teaching, standing at this tax bo- that this tax booth this entire time. They were teaching and, and, and preaching and reaching those in that community. He overheard and he knew who Jesus was. And Jesus says, Come follow me, and he could have been like, I'm not, I'm not the guy for that. I'm sorry. No, that's not, that's not me. No, he trusted the words of the one who was calling him, and he just dropped it, and he went. And when we are called, there are two things that happen. And they're both centered around a sense of radical obedience. Excuse me while I drink some water. <laughs> the first is, we're called out of something. We're called out of sin. I think this is at, at the very first moment when you feel like God's really calling you to follow him and you're, you're, you're figuring this whole Jesus thing out or you're a new believer and like that's really where we end up getting focused and, we, and sometimes we end up getting stuck. But it's not just for new believers. It's not just for people that are searching. Being called out of sin is something that is not just a moment, it is a process. God's at work within each of us all the time. And a call to follow him is a call away from sin. It's a call away from the things that are holding us back from the fullness of who God wants us to be. Matthew and the disciples, they left their old life behind. They set it all down. They dropped everything, left their old life there, and chose to follow Jesus. No questions asked. But not only is this a call from sin, it's also a call to somebody. And this is, I think, where the rubber really meets the road with a lot of us, and myself included. A call to follow Jesus is not just to repent of your sin and then just kind of sit tight in your home and, your, and create this, this safe little Jesus zone where you can hang out and feel good about living the rest of life. A call to follow Jesus is a call to go to people who need him. To people who need to know who he is, who need to feel the unconditional love that was extended to all of us on the cross.
I mean, if you look in this scripture, Jesus went to Matthew at his tax booth. Matthew didn't go to him. He went to Matthew. Disciples went with. If you look at what happens next, Matthew decides, hey, I get this, this whole Jesus thing. I get it. All my friends need to meet you too. Let's have them all over at my house. And Jesus went to them. And the disciples follow. Keeping in mind that to associate with that crowd was bringing some great levels of uncredibility for them as a ministry, you would think, right? I mean, look at what the, look at what the Pharisees say, right? Why are you hanging out with all these people? It's likely that they said that after the party was over because there's no way they're spending time around them, right? Party's over, they're waiting. They're like waiting to like get them like they usually do, <laughs> right? Following Jesus means that we are not governed by the perception of others. That's not what we base the living of our life off of. We are governed by God's Spirit at work in us and where He leads us. That doesn't mean we should be stupid about it, right? That doesn't mean if you have a drinking problem, you need to go out to a bunch of parties with all your old friends all by yourself. That's a really dumb idea. You'll notice in Scripture, Jesus never sent any of the disciples out by themselves to do ministry. At the very least, it was always by twos. Often it was more than that. But he still sent them out to those who were far from him and those who needed him the most. And I, I understand this is all pretty basic stuff. This is simple stuff. I mean, I'm a youth guy. I work with teenagers for a living. I try and simplify things, right? And this portion of Scripture is actually pretty short and it's pretty foundational. But do not mistake something being simple for being easy. Oftentimes in life, some of the hardest things to do are actually really the simplest things. Go into all the world and make disciples. Pretty simple instruction. Doesn't make it easy. And for those of us who have hesitations, and, and believe me, I put myself in this category, all of us in one way or another probably wrestle with this. Recognize what's standing in the way. If you know God is calling you from something, if there's a particular sin in your life that you've identified, or maybe He's bringing it to your attention right now. And you're going, I, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't go there. I can't get rid of it. It's too much of a part of me. I'm, too, I'm in too deep. I'd be giving up way too much. Or just the fact of uncertainty, of knowing what's going to come next. I'm sorry, I can't do that. That brings to light the areas in our life where in reality we're trusting ourselves more than we're trusting God. Or on the other side of it, I can't be used by God. Look at me. Look at everything that I've done in my life. Look at all this stuff that's part of me. It's my identity now. There's no way I could do that. Once again, we are relying on and, and leaning on ourselves, and in this case, our broken selves as our identity, rather than saying yes and just following Jesus and trusting him. The other side of it, if you know God is calling you to someone, to a certain place, and you're saying, no, no way, not going to do that. <laughs> Why? Why? If you've committed to follow Jesus, Jesus goes where those people are. I mean, this is, I've worked in ministry and worked in different churches in a variety of different capacities, and, and I myself have even said this at times. I, I just don't know anybody, really, who would fall into that category. But yeah, I know 
some people maybe who don't know Jesus, but not like, I don't know them. I'm not like friends with people who are far from God and don't really know him. I'm not really eating dinner with many people who I could invite over to, to do something like that. My friends, that's a problem. That's a problem. If we're called to be a disciple, if we're called to follow Jesus and go where he goes, he is with those who do not know him. And what ends up happening is we look at these lists a lot like I was. And a lot, I mean, even now, I'm still tempted in and of going, well, I don't do these things, and I do do these things, and I, we create this, this, this world around us. This Really, it's a barrier that keeps us from being able to connect relationally with those who do not know Jesus. And we do that because it makes us feel safe. Let's just be honest. It's comfortable to do that. But a life to follow Jesus is a life to get out of that bubble. Like Peter and, and, and Andrew and the rest of the disciples that were there, they followed Jesus right into the most awkward situation they'd probably ever been in in their life. Knowing full well that people were going to judge them. Knowing full well that it was probably going to bring into question their own moral character. Knowing full well that some people were probably going to think and falsely assume that to sit down and eat and enjoy life and experience life with those who are in their sin unrepentantly is condoning the sin. Clearly, that's not the case. If spending time with them, if building relationships with them, if, if sitting down and getting a cup of coffee with someone or, or, or going to their party or going to their celebration or wedding or whatever is the same as condoning their sinful life and their behavior, then clearly Jesus wouldn't have been there. He wouldn't have brought his disciples either. We need to be careful that we are not replacing following a person of Jesus with a list of moral superiority that just helps us to feel good and feel comfortable. We're called to radical obedience. We're called to radical followership. And that means we're going to be uncomfortable sometimes. That means we're going to be rubbing shoulders with some people that are like, I, I don't have anything in common with them. I have no idea how to relate to this person right now. And then we almost, it's like we overthink it and we overcomplicate it and we think, well, I need to know the right words to say or I need to know the right thing to do. No, you don't. One of the things I love about this church is that you guys... So open, loving, welcoming, no matter who people are, you welcome them with loving arms into this church. If you can put it into practice here, you can put it into practice out there. That means in those moments when you're like, you know what, yeah, that coworker of mine who lives really not too far from me and we could carpool together to work real easily but then that means that we're going to be stuck in a car together and we're going to be talking to each other and then maybe they're going to want to be friends with me and I don't know that I can do that. I've got plenty of friends already. I don't need any new friends. I mean, am I the only person who has these conversations with themselves? I don't think so. I hope not. We're called to radical followership. We're called to go where Jesus goes. And that means putting ourselves in some situations that will make us feel uncomfortable. And that's okay. That's okay because there's a bigger picture here, and that is the grace of God and the unconditional love of Jesus that was extended to all of us on the cross needs to be experienced by others. And you're the mechanism by which he does that. I like the, the contrast in Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 13. Jesus warns about this again, saying, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, 
stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I get the tenth of all I get. He's created his safe bubble where he feels comfortable. Justifying his own, his own morality. But then the tax collector stood at a distance because he's unclean. He's not even allowed to be at the temple. Stood at a distance. He would not even look to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's this contrast. It's a great parable of Jesus talking about this very issue. Do not build up this moral sense of barriers around yourself without ever going out beyond that to reach those who are far from him and think that that's really following Jesus. You're relying more on moralism than really the person of Jesus. One final thought. This is something that's interesting. This is something that's going to challenge the evangelists in the room, those of you who have that gift of evangelism. Note that here in this passage, it doesn't say anything about the fact that any of these friends of Matthew's decided to follow Jesus. It doesn't say anything about new people joining the group. It doesn't even say anything about Jesus giving any kind of an invitation for new people to join the group. By a lot of standards today, and I count myself in this, and really, I was challenged by this personally when I read it, you would look at that and go, wow, what a complete waste of your time. You'd be like, you spent all that time around all those people who needed to know you, who needed to follow you, and you didn't even ask them to follow you. You didn't say, hey, who do you think I am? You just sat down, ate with them, hung out with them, and then left, and that was it? And you call that ministry. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it really is that simple. I feel like we overcomplicate it sometimes as if, well, if I didn't say a prayer with somebody or if I, I went to this thing and it... I mean, going back to the story that I, that I started with of me coming to Illinois and being at this party, I left there and I was like, wow, that was awkward. That was weird. I didn't pray with anyone. I didn't even really remember very many people's names. I'm a terrible person. What is wrong with me? God, why did you bring me there? That was a waste of my time. And then the enemy uses that as an opportunity to come in and see, like, see, you think you're following Jesus. What is wrong with you? You're ruining your witness. You're condoning sin. And you didn't even pray with anybody. How dare you? And you say you're following Jesus. In hindsight, here's the amazing thing of how this comes full circle. Probably about a year after that, I'm a small group leader for young adult college age students. Um, and uh, one of the friends of mine who was at that party with me, uh, we kind of leading this group together. And this pothead guy, Andy, who I had a conversation with, who I thought didn't even remember who I was. I, I don't even remember exchanging phone numbers with him, but he got in touch with me somehow. And he said, dude, I, I'm like, I, I need to start going to church. I, I, I'm like done with all this drug stuff. I'm done with all this partying. It is exhausting. It is ridiculous. I feel like I need to really turn my life around. Can you help me? I don't know where else to go. Like, you... Truth be told, had I not been there and had that kind of an attitude, I could have easily just been there and been like this weird, awkward fly on the wall going, okay, this is, this is weird. I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm not going to make friends with any of these people. I don't need friends like this in my life. But I didn't do that. I allowed myself to be humbled and say, okay, God, just use me in this situation however you see fit. And I didn't find any dividends of it later until at least a year later. 
He joins our small group. He commits his life to the Lord. Had I not gone with Jesus to those who don't know him and had been in that situation, it's very likely he would have not had nowhere else to turn. He wouldn't have known where to go. He would not have known where to go. And he easily could have just had the enemy come in, deceive him, and just brush it off and be like, well, I guess that was just a, this is who I am and this is where I'm going to be. I got nowhere else to go, so I'm just going to sit right here. You don't know how God's going to use you. Don't sell yourself short on your witness in these kind of situations. And don't avoid them. When God's calling you to go, just go. Don't be stupid about it. Don't be foolish about it. Don't go by yourself. Use wisdom. Use wise counsel. Use God's word to guide you. But don't put up this barrier around yourself and look at all the things that you're not a part of and assume that that's the same as following Jesus. It's not about a checklist. It's not about having it all figured out. Right? For those of you who are new to this Jesus thing or you're trying to figure this thing out, this is, this is an amazing life to live. There's a great community to be a part of. This is not about you having it all figured out and cleaning your act up first. Jesus just says, come. Follow me. Let's do this thing together. All the other stuff in your life that, that's getting in the way of you and God, we will figure that out and work on that together. So my challenge to all of you is this, this morning. First question, what is God calling you from? What's the sin in your life that he's calling you from? If you're sitting there thinking, yeah, there are all these people that I would love to go out and reach, but I don't have the time for that. Or fill in, your bl- fill in the excuse. I'm sorry, that's pride. That can easily become pride. We all have time. Every single one of us eats every day. At least two times. I skip breakfast every now and then. Every one of us does have some time in our life to invite others to be a part of it. Does that mean your house is going to be spick and span every time they come over? No, and it doesn't have to be. There's a challenge right there for some of us, right? (laughs) We all have time for that. So who, what is God calling you from? And then secondly, who is he calling you to? And this is something that's for all of us. Maybe it's a particular person. Maybe there's a specific family in your neighborhood and, and around you. Who is God calling you to? And what are the excuses that you're bringing up that are getting in your way from really following Jesus? What is God calling you from? Who is he calling you to? And then lastly, what are you going to do about it? So we all are called to do something about it, right? 